Okay, well, hello, and um, thank you so much for attending this webinar today called The Importance of Web Accessibility, How Being Inclusive Can Improve Your University's Website. Brought to you by Smile and in association with our friends at Site Improve. We have some really knowledgeable and talented speakers today. Uh, with accessibility as something of a hot topic, I think it's really important that we're able to share our collective knowledge and empower one another to create a more inclusive internet. So our first speaker today is Jennifer Chadwick, who is the Senior Accessibility and Digital Inclusion Strategist at Site Improve. I'd like to personally take a moment to say thank you to Jennifer for all of her hard work up to this point today. Uh, I've learned so much in listening to Jennifer's experience putting this webinar together, and I feel very privileged to uh, be able to work with her on this. She is the definition of an expert in this space and a, a real champion for digital inclusion. We're also joined by the incredibly hardworking and super talented Sarah Jones from the University of Gloucestershire. Uh, I've been uh, working with Sarah very closely over the last 18 months on the brand new gloss.ac.uk flagship website and Sarah has been championing accessibility throughout that process. Uh, I've invited Sarah to this panel today because I think that she brings practical examples, uh, a very valuable insight from the university perspective that I'm sure a lot of people in the audience will identify with today. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm Nathan. Uh, I'm the co-founder and solutions architect at Smile, a digital agency that strives to help universities and colleges become more authentic, timely, and personalized with a suite of creative services and digital products. We work with over 40 different institutions from across the UK and North America, and we are passionate about making universities and college websites more accessible. I want to give a quick shout out to Site Improve today. Without their support, this webinar would not have been possible. Smile is a silver Site Improve partner, and we really believe that Site Improve is an incredible platform. We've used it with a number of university and college clients, and in particular, the accessibility tools have been critical in the success of our client projects. The platform is much bigger, admittedly, than just accessibility, uh, and all of those other bits are, are just as fantastic. But as far as tooling goes, this is easily one of the best for accessibility. And I, I really identify with how Site Improve approaches uh, accessibility reporting in the way that it kind of leads digital teams uh, through the process to create more accessible sites. So if you are looking at tooling, you should definitely go and check Site Improve out. Now, I also want to take a moment to uh, set some expectations here. So in today's webinar, we're not going to be looking through the AA spec. We're not going to be looking at international legislations or anything like that. There's, there's already a ton of great resources on those things, which we've compiled alongside some other bonus links on our website. And you can find that at wearesmile.com forward slash webinar. But today, I'm excited to talk to you about how you can prove the importance of accessibility fundamentals to those that should care, and, and also some practical examples of how you can weave this into your culture. Accessibility is not a checkbox exercise, and I think as a sector, we're in real danger of viewing it that way. If you do just view it kind of as, as a tick in the box, not only are you shutting the door, to a whole squadron of people, you, you're probably kind of missing the point too. Accessible websites benefit everyone. And for, for me, the example that made me realize is trying to watch the TV with a newborn baby in the house. So the slightest noise would wake my, my daughter up when she was a baby. And as a result, now I've come to watch TV almost exclusively with subtitles. But, you know, accessibility is more than just a nice to have. It is a fundamental. And as universities and colleges, we are viewed as 
centers for good in our communities. So people, people are looking at you to set the example. And these four pillars that are on screen uh, are, are statements that the panelists and I were in total agreement over. Uh, and throughout, you'll see how relevant these are to, to their experience and to their journey. Now, speaking of journeys, uh, the Q&A and uh, the Q&A is now open. We'll have some time towards the end where I'll, I'll take your questions to the speakers. And we also have a poll, which I've just opened. Uh, and we'll be reviewing and sharing those results later too. So do look out uh, for that poll. And we look forward to uh, seeing how you vote. So without further ado, I would like to invite Jennifer from Site Improved to the stage. And uh, Jennifer is going to be talking us through the facts. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Nathan, and thanks, Sarah, for having me, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to talk about this. Um, I'm in complete agreement with those fantastic points. And um, yeah, just in working as a user experience designer and graphic designer throughout my, my past, um, I quickly realized, you know, in meeting people with diverse abilities and uh, what they'd say is disabilities, um, I've just learned so much about how people use the web and then, you know, kind of just, you know, in through a series of aha moments kind of turned to um, doing uh, accessibility uh, full time or sort of working with teams on this. Um, so I guess I'm just here to, you know, to, to present or represent the facts that I hope I think I think we all know, which is that, you know, people, people are people. They, uh, as I move through the slides, yeah, just move forward. Yeah, so people uh, with disabilities, if they self identify, or you know, if they want to disabled people, people with disabilities, however they want to see and want to phrase it. Um, they use technology, uh, phones, smart TVs, websites, applications, um, any, you know, LMS learning software, the kiosk, you know, to buy tickets at the airport, uh, voice assistant um, products uh, every day, just like everybody else. Um, and then, yeah, as people are people, they have the right to do so freely without any technical barriers to that experience and to have sort of equal access to um, online, you know, content and information that's presented online, um, you know, or if it's their own personal information, such as it is with, you know, higher education sometimes or banking or, or, um, or retail, um, especially su and student services online, especially when we talk about the work that that you do. Um, yeah, I mean, what what we're saying is that they have the right to access this stuff freely, without, um, you know, having to have an alternative, without having to, you know, call someone up or email them for the exact same information. All those services online with digital is a real opportunity to level that playing field. So we know that all people use these different technologies that I just mentioned. And then if you're not quite familiar with, you know, or haven't, you know, in your travels met, uh, really get to know people with disabilities and how they, you know, how they enable themselves. Um, they use assistive technology such as, you know, hardware like a keyboard um, or a wand that they'd hold on their mouth on the, on the screen you see a, a a girl who's using um, her mouth to hold a wand to tap onto a tablet uh, tablet screen without the use of uh, the rest of her body. Or, or software such as screen readers, uh, that speech output that'll read everything on the screen for you. So there's a student here who's listening to um, the screen reader speak um, as he, and then he'll use the keyboard to access that, um, that website. So also, you know, what would be considered an adaptive strategy would be um, ASL or BSL, sort of British Sign Language or American Sign Language in the US. So um, these sort of adaptive strategies and assistive technologies have been around for, I would say, maybe close to 30 years. So people enable themselves, you know, they're enabled by that technology. Just that back. So, yeah, 
So if someone is blind, for instance, they are regularly use, going about their day using a screen reader and a keyboard to navigate a website, they're good to go. So that's how, you know, they, as much as possible, they're able to sort of maintain that autonomy and independence um, in living, working, you know, at, you know, um, learning, studying, you know, buying things online, that kind of thing. So what we're saying is that if your digital properties are inaccessible to, you know, or incompatible with these uh, assistive technologies or adaptive strategies, you're the one causing the barrier. So people are actually disabled by the lack of available channels, formats, and options in your digital world on your website or application or, you know, services, not, not the other way around. So people have been adapting to a world that is socially, you know, sort of social and, you know, technical world that has been exclusive all this time. We're in the process of having the opportunity to change that and to really make the difference. And the final change is with your sites, your content, you know, our, our, your documents, that kind of thing. And then the other thing to remember is that some people have visible uh, disabilities or diversity. Others have invisible disabilities or what's known as episodic disabilities, such as um, seizures. It's not affecting them all the time, but it is a significant impact on, li on life. So sometimes accommodations or uh, is needed, sometimes not. So the other thing is that not everyone, you know, self-identifies say on a consensus form, that they have a disability and they don't have to, they don't have to. You know, so people are just people, those people who they are. Um, so we have to remember that we may not always see um, or, and then thus maybe understand um, um, someone's needs and preferences for, for digital. The other thing is that populations are aging and obviously people are gonna, you know, as we get older, as the, the body sort of um, grows into more deficits um, and difficulties, um, people will need, you know, continue to need what we call an inclusive design, right? Sort of just clear, simple uh, layouts, of websites, documents, um, clear and effective language, communication, uh, interactions, make things simple so it could be sort of easily understood. Another part of that we'll touch upon is um, people where uh, English may be their second language, if you just arrived or you're studying information or you know the complexity of language can be a can be a barrier for some even though it's not a, technically not under under the umbrella of accessibility the other thing to remember is that cognitive disabilities or you know neuro actual you know diverse neurodiversity neuro abilities such as you know dyslexia autism ADHD uh, and dyspraxia are kind of being recognized in students um, or you know children as they move into life and move into stages of life of work, study, and you know just just going into in, in the various pleasures of life. Um, at the same time, these things are being diagnosed in adults later on. So we know that uh, cognitive neurodiversity exists. Again, as you know people, you know, the digital gatekeepers, we have the opportunity to, to really include everyone and make, um, make things uh, easy and uh, easy to understand and to focus on. So online learning really allows for that flexibility of different models. That's what's so wonderful about higher education and university, university life. <clears throat> And then, yeah, sort of as a, a final fact. So as I say, as apart from supporting the rights, needs and diverse abilities of people across the UK and in the world in general, um, accessibility and inclusion, uh, inclusion in society is just the right of all people. And it's also the, the, the true way to achieve good service, good education, good business, and kind of the only acceptable standard of living as we move forward. For me, having worked in as a user experience designer, wasn't really worth my salt <laughs> as a designer of experiences for web and uh, for digital, unless I fully included everyone that I know exists in the world to uh, to make it better for them and, and truly, you know, stop those barriers and actually, you know, stop excluding people from from what they're rightfully um, 
uh, wet for the out. So inclusive design to me is kind of the next tech technological innovation, especially in education. And it's also just in general an investment in, in the future of a uh, future of people and the future in a better society overall. Big speech, <laughs> but it's true. And um, I think when I talk to teams that I work with um, and I'm really excited to sort of understand a little bit more about how you know Sarah's Sarah works as well. Um, but I I just I just want to say as well. I mean, this is an incredible opportunity that you you have to become leaders in that in that innovation. So moving from institutions that cause those barriers to sort of as I said, future ready leaders in technological innovation, inclusion, and in every you know in the digital world, hopefully in the built environment as well and diversity in education, learning models, and uh, opportunities. Uh, a fear of non-compliance or sort of an uncertainty about, um, about what laws are about, what actually people need. I have no, you know, I've never met a blind person. I've never met someone who's deaf. I, I've never, you know, I don't know what they need. I don't know how they, how they use the services or how they use the web. Going from that sort of fear of non-compliance uh, with laws or, or, or WCAG um, and uncertainty about what people need to a positive people-centric institution where you do, you do learn those things. You kind of gain empathy and really understand what people need. And then you're kind of equipped and skilled with, you know, within your role to make those sort of tiny micro changes to your process in order to, you know, make a, a document accessible, for instance, and make a huge difference to someone. And then you just keep going, you're, you're, you're being proactive instead of reactive, um, where you get into, you know, you're not causing barriers, you're actually trying to prevent them and remove them as best you can as you move forward. And that's all you can do, you can just do your best. Um, and then finally, feeling overwhelmed <laughs> to, oh, you know, this is something you may not have considered before. It's not something you've had in your practices or processes before. So allowing changes to take time. Um, so as I say, you know, this is an exciting opportunity to, you know, now have people fully ex included in, in your, your digital, in the digital space. So start today and just keep going. Um, and it's true, uh, it really is true. It can take up to two to four years for an institution like a university or a corporation, um, you know, big or small to uh, adopt and implement full change. So there we have um, one thing that I keep in my back pocket and I always sort of, when I discuss, you know, inclusive design, this really is kind of, um, this definition is from the Inclusive Design Research Center. Uh, proudly, I've been able to work with them uh, living in Toronto. Um, they, uh, they've been around for about 25 to 30 years. Um, so inclusive design as a concept is not new. They've just worked globally to try to help people understand it. So inclusive design is an approach to user experience design, you know, content writing, uh, visual design, user experience design, development for all digital properties that takes into consideration the not only the needs of people meaning be able to understand the content but their preferences as well I, I prefer to have this format or I, I prefer to read a website this way um, so the consideration of the preferences needs and abilities of all users as part of the original design so this is just sort of a, a statement to commit to say I'm not going to have accessibility as an afterthought. I'm not just going to throw it on the developer or the quality, you know, the quality assurance tester at the end. We're thinking, we're thinking about, you know, just, not just one one type of person, but maybe you know, close to five different use, uh, disability types. Um, every time we we do something new, every time we start a new project or write a new uh, document or think about a, a website feature. And then so finally, some sort of tips and tricks to get started. As I said, I think I've covered them all. <laughs> uh, shift the social model of disability. Let's do it. We can actually shift the social model of, you know, that was exclusive to being inclusive. We can do that within our, uh, within, uh, our work. And then number two is think about everyone when we're writing and designing experiences. Um, I mentioned language. Don't forget about language. Um, plain, concise clear language. I think there's some sort of reading level 
in Canada, we call it grade six, which would probably be sort of mid senior school. Just the point is that, you know, a, a child of the age of about 13, 12 to 13 would, would, be, would, would be able to read and understand it, if, if possible. I know some topics are more complex, but language being plain and, and, and easily understood as instructions or labels, that's also the principle there. Don't forget about language. And then finally, leverage tools. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the accessibility checker in Word or any of the Microsoft Office products. Uh, Adobe has their accessibility checker in uh, for PDFs, um, PowerPoint, things like that. There are little sort of tools everywhere. And then of course, Site Improve, our, our, our big thing is to have a platform where you manage all your tasks. We will flag accessibility issues for you, help, you know, tell you how to how to fix them, give you that education as you go along day in and day out, which is why I love it. Um, and then number five is is learn from people. So uh, people with disabilities often, uh, yeah, they'd love to hear from you and have them sort of explain or, you know, help help guide you in what they need. Um, don't be afraid to ask if you can get people with disabilities to practice some co-design or um, there's, actually I'll just move forward to show you. Um, and in order to familiarize yourself with the user needs, even if you don't have direct access to someone with certain uh, types of disabilities, um, physical, uh, visual, um, hearing or auditory, cognitive and speech. Um, there are ways that you can sort of create user personas um, or sort of like a, you know, an, an understanding of or sort of a profile of someone who has those particular needs in order to keep them in mind and make it really easy just to go back to, you know, Sam who's blind and, you know, is studying this or, you know, has these particular needs. That really does help. Um, so either, you know, engage with real users or create these fantastic personas, or what I have here, a couple of, um, you know, highly recommended uh, resources. The Web Accessibility Initiative or WAI, that's the department within the W3C or www.website, um, a World Wide Web Consortium that governs, you know, the standards body for the internet. The WAI is that standards body inside uh, the W3C that um, publishes WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and sort of creates some fantastic resources in how to meet WCAG. So they have um, web accessibility perspective videos. They're about one to two minutes long. They're fantastic for just watching, you know, and understanding in a really casual way how how people use the web or what, what, what they might need and some demonstrations of that. Um, and then the WAI uh, Diverse Abilities and Barriers webpage, go there. And then there are five different sections of those, those disability types I mentioned. Expand that section and it'll tell you what the sort of disability is, what people need, and then some common barriers to designs and writing that they may face. So you have this really clear guide as to what not to do. Um, and then finally, the do's and don'ts on designing for accessibility. This resource is fantastic. I found it in about 2016. So it's the UK government that uh, produced it, but it's just a series of posters. So kind of a, that you can print out and place on your wall or you know, just have share in a PDF uh, with your teams. And it's sort of a do this, don't do this for different types of, of disabilities and needs. So yeah, without further ado, Sarah, maybe I'll, I'll hand it to you to talk about your work at the university. Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, thank you, Nathan, for your kind introduction. Hi, everyone. And um, Jennifer, I can totally relate um, to that simple language uh, tip that you gave. So I've got a background working on private sector websites. So for me, learning the HE jargon was certainly an obstacle that I had to overcome myself. And I think, um, you know, learning to put yourself in the user's shoes is really vital to becoming better with accessibility. And those uh, resources that Jennifer's just mentioned are really great. So um, do have a look at those and a reminder that the links are on Nathan's webpage as well uh, for you to refer to afterwards. 
Um, and this sort of first-hand experience of, of watching different types of users use technology is something I was lucky enough to experience early on in my career um, when I worked for the assistive technology company, Dolphin Computer Access. And I would say that testing and researching with real users is really, really important and gives you a great deal of insight um, and, and motivates you massively. So um, good example. Uh, for those of you who've looked at our poll question one, if we tested that with real users, we would have quickly uh, realized that we missed out an option for responding to that. So apologies and thank you for giving us a real world example. Uh, so University of Gloucestershire is where I work now. I manage the digital team there and uh, we kicked off our website project just over two years ago now. Um, it's fair to say it was largely a technical project for us uh, focused on replatforming our website from SharePoint. Um, as we're really falling behind in terms of innovation and, and being fit for purpose. So the goal for us was to move to something more future proof and easy to maintain. Um, and, and in order to better serve the needs of our users, obviously that was a, a big goal too and a big part of it. And it presents a, a big opportunity. When you're building something like this from scratch, of course you've got opportunities to improve your user journey from a variety of angles. So whether that be the content, the journey flow, uh, the design, and of course the accessibility of the content that you produce. As you might guess, uh, we opted to work with Smile and that's why I'm here talking to you guys today. So thank you, Nathan, for the invite. Um, accessibility as it was a concern area, I'd say for us, and a personal goal for me being an area of interest. Um, so I'm happy to say that the project's already been delivering on that since we launched uh, last month. So ultimately, we all like choice and being inclusive with your design and, and your product gives more people more choices. We've been on a bit of a journey with this project, project and I'd like to share some of our learnings with you. Hopefully there'll be some tips or tricks that might help you with your work too. Is our website perfect? No, uh, but we're really pleased we're in better shape than we were and even in better shape than some of our peers. Um, and the important thing is that we're now set up with the tools and insights um, to continually improve what we're doing. Okay, so um, I think it can be really tempting when you talk about accessibility to point the stick of the law and the regulations at people. Uh, when you're first introducing that concept of having an accessible website. Um, but for me, this feels a bit heavy handed and it might work with some types of people, uh, but I much prefer to talk about usability for all and and then that way use it as a bit of a carrot. Um, as Jennifer and Nathan both alluded, accessible websites have so many benefits, not just to uh, our users, but also to us as digital content producers. Once you've built empathy in your institution as well, each way, the buy-in is far greater and the motivation sort of grows much more naturally, which is helpful. When I, when I talk to people um, at the University of Gloucestershire, I also like to give relatable examples. So um, as users of the internet themselves, they'll be able to empathize much easier. Um, and as indicated by this punny slide and the carrot sticks, hopefully you got that pun, um, I do love food. So one of my favorite examples um, to give people is maybe when they visit a, a restaurant website, um, might actually be more relatable in recent times. So that's useful. Uh, but maybe you've done that and you've clicked on the link that says menu in the navigation and then your heart sinks a bit because the menu's a PDF and it's got lots of pages. You have to pinch and zoom and scroll around just to find stuff. Um, it feels like a nuisance and compared to a well-designed responsive web page, it's not really the best format for anybody, let alone somebody who might be using assistive technology to gather the information that they want. So my other sort of tip here is, is when you're talking to people who are creating content to go online, don't, don't just land them with the problem. 
um, talk about solutions. It's, it's really likely outside of your team that they're not technical people. So they won't think about alternates quickly or readily like we might. Um, so another example really um, that I can think of is uploading video content onto YouTube. Even if the, the end goal is not to um, host them or, or have them access there, um, it's a really useful shortcut for people to doing uh, video transcriptions. So um, it automatically will do a lot of that work for you. And then you've just got a much shorter job correcting it. In most cases, people are delighted with that as a solution because it takes away a lot of the pain from doing it manually. Um, and then having that content on the page with their video, wherever that does end up, um, helps their content to be found um, on search, whether that's on site or on Google. So it's often, you know, you're killing more than one bird with a stone. Um, often people are really familiar already with the bigger items or well-known things like putting captions on videos or um, definitely alt tags on images. Everybody seems to know about that and, and cites it when you talk about accessibility, which is great. But I think it's the slightly more sort of hidden stuff, maybe stuff that is in the code. It's harder for people around your university to understand. And it's also harder for teams like, like the web team to monitor. So hierarchy and headings throughout a page, making sure link text makes sense out of context, even just front loading a sentence to make it uh, quicker for re readers to skim through. Um, these, these are the things that are less known and, and less easy to monitor. And on very large websites, like at the websites we all work on, when you're moving over huge volumes of content as we have done pre-launch, it's, this is where a tool can really help you and create efficiency and find a lot of those issues that you would otherwise miss or would take you a lifetime to find. I would say it's almost impossible to order a website. Um, ours has got over 7,000 pages. It's impossible to do that manually. So um, I would definitely recommend a tool to help with that. So um, the thing is, with building a new website, it's never going to be a silver bullet. And, and of course, it isn't necessary to do that in order to get better accessibility. And I'm not here to proclaim that we're perfect. As I say, we're not 100% we're not accessible. That honestly isn't the case yet. Um, and, and sort of seeking perfection, especially pre-launch, is not realistic or good for morale. Um, but the important thing is to embed accessibility in your processes and make sure it's always going to be considered and part of the picture in a digital project as early as possible. Um, so I think it's a good, a good strategy to embed it from the start. So for us, things like creating an accessible color palette for our brand colors um, really highlights it in a visual way to colleagues. Um, we've actually got a Google spreadsheet with all of our brand colors on it. Um, it's like got a foreground, background axis, and um, it shows when the color combinations pass, uh, contrast checks or not. And our creative team within the marketing department weren't always good at remembering um, what, what good contrast looked like. So um, having created this as a resource for them uh, has been really, really valuable for them. And they're really good now at using that. They've really embraced it. And I hardly ever have to speak to them now about anything to do with color contrast because it's built into their thinking. And they refer to that at the beginning uh, whenever they're starting to create a new asset. Uh, this stuff takes time though. I, I joined the university just over two years ago for this project and this is still quite new to a lot of people outside of my digital team um, and outside the wider marketing department. And even now I'm asked by people, when when's the deadline for, for accessible documents? And, and obviously I have to tell them actually pass by in 2018. Um, so this, you know, it is going to take time to embed it in your culture. Uh, one of the biggest hurdles for, for us, I think, um, is the accessibility of, of hosted documents. 
we had over 1500 documents on our old website uh, while some of them aren't needed anymore and, and, and were obviously able to be deleted there was still a massive range of information held in non-html format and there are things like forms flyers uh, maps even the prospectus for our 2021 starters and what we did uh, to tackle that we started with a massive spreadsheet of all of those documents and uh, we sent out a series of communications to the document owners identified for each doc during the very 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 early stages of our project um, telling them about the regulations uh, talking about the options and asking them for their feedback and how they'd like to tackle it going forward and it's it is hard to imagine that this this was still new for a lot of people because we're so embedded aren't we as web people in the regulations um, so we've actually updated one of our processes now off off the back of this work so when uh, people approach the website team to update content or add content online we have a, a work request form and now we've added a new question in there. So before somebody can upload a document for, a, for us to add, it asks them a question about the accessibility and they have to then confirm to us that they've either tested the document and it's accessible or they're happy for us to present it in a different format online. And not only does this serve as a prompt for them to go and do that test, uh, but it saves a lot of work for us as a digital team and going back and forth. Uh, previously, we, we would reply by email and say, oh, you do, you do know that this needs to be accessible. Have you tested it? That kind of thing. So it's saved a lot of work in both directions. I want to tell you as well now about another great example and, and a happy ending here. So, uh, the placements team for our health students creates a large amount of PDF documents for us to host online. They're not necessarily marketing focused uh, or for recruitment, but we have to host them here on the marketing website for ease of access. So when students or their external mentors are working off site, they need to be able to get hold of this stuff. Um, and to be honest, when I spoke to this, the members of staff involved internally, it was a difficult conversation. People are busy, they're working to short deadlines and, and they don't really like to change how they've done things in the past. They're used to their processes and they, they, they need a really big reason to change that. So at first there was definitely resistance and the person that I was talking to was even speaking about okay well I'll, I'll build another website of my own to avoid the regulations it won't be a university website um, and clearly that wasn't the best solution for everybody um, I think as well often people we talk to might not have a lot of contact with the typical accessibility target those user that user group um, so I think it's really useful to explore how all users might need to access the content and how making it accessible has knock-on benefits for everybody and helps everybody to access the information um, and things like Nathan's example of using the subtitles uh, to watch TV you know that that's a really good example of where accessibility solutions are used by more than just that audience um, I think it's it's obviously really important to empathise with your colleagues and the challenges that they've got, as well as the challenges of our users, and work with them, not against them. Um, so the the guy I was speaking to in this case, one of his objections to having the docs converted into HTML pages was that his users often choose to print out these user guides so that they can look at them alongside. Uh, their computer screen while they're using a third party website. So these are like um, instructional documents and guides. Um, and we have to remember that not everybody has mo multiple monitors like us digital folk. So talking about how actually it could even be easier for somebody to read this content on their smartphone if we format it nicely and then they can have that next to their laptop. That, that was kind of a selling point. Um, but the big the big win for me that was we actually invested some of our website project fund into some additional work on print friendly style sheets. So we really had made sure that these pages would be able to be printed nicely and come out. 
in a format that works on paper as well. Um, so that really helped uh, to get some buy-in with this team. Um, and as I say, often when you provide solutions for accessibility, you actually take away some internal pains as well. So um, what's happened here, the, the member of staff I spoke to had actually already used WordPress before. So I was able to give them a login and show them how they could create their own guides online. And that was a really great solution for them. They're able to keep the content updated themselves and then they don't have to uh, rework the content in Word when it's changed, convert it to PDF, um, contact somebody in the digital team to upload it and replace it to make sure the links aren't broken. So all of those steps are actually removed. Um, so we've actually taken away some workload as well as give them an, an additional way to work. And they're now really happily creating these articles themselves. Uh, they go directly into the CMS and they've even further enhanced the content that they produce, adding sort of embedded videos uh, to as instructional guides. And they can link between the pages really nicely. So when it refers to something like log into the dashboard, they can just link to the article that shows people how to log in and create their account. Um, so that makes it much easier for people to find the information they want as well. So the output is better, better for all of our users, and they feel really good about that. They're creating something that's better ultimately for everyone. Uh, so I guess in wrap up for me, I just want to say this is a lot. Um, there's a lot of pages, a lot of documents, a lot of technical factors. Um, to compliance and we have a lot of colleagues so my advice is don't take this all on yourself it's important that you share this responsibility and the way that we do that is to create and train ambassadors around our institution who can beat the same drum uh, we booked and held some internal training sessions um, to help people understand accessibility and it's also an added bonus actually to discover some resources as part of the Site Improve Academy to help us to do that. My other tip is to use some automation and we've talked about tooling. There are many out there. Humans can't review 7,000 plus pages quickly. I couldn't have done it without some software to help with that auditing process. Um, don't beat yourself up about imperfection. Um, it takes time. It's hard. It doesn't happen overnight. A, a website can launch overnight. Uh, but there's a lot of work involved, except that it's a journey that you're on. Um, it's not just about putting a, a statement on your website for an accessibility notice. It's a reality of a huge amount of work. Um, and as Jennifer said, it's, it's a cultural shift. Um, and it takes a, an element of trust too. For me, I can be a bit of a control freak, uh, but you have to let people go, uh, empower them, give them the tools and the advice that they need to do the work. Um, and take responsibility for it, or it can become really overwhelming. Um, don't be afraid to challenge content that doesn't meet the standards. Um, we on our new website have some workflows in place and that enables the experts in the digital team to review the content uh, and check it prior to publish. Um, people, when I speak to them about this, really like this as backup. They don't like the fact that they could publish content and it might not be accessible. So reassuring them that that step is in place and we've got their back as, has been really useful. Um, and also consider when you're talking to other ambassadors, uh, uh, you know, think about the other outputs that you've got that are digital that might not fall within your team's responsibility. So things like your social media posts, videos that are going out on various different platforms, job adverts even, um, surveys that are run by different teams. Um, this is why it's really important to create ambassadors in, in other departments because um, you may only have control over the, the core website. And I think if, if you're doing a good job there and, and there's a mismatch in other areas of your communications, then, then that's not going to look good. Um, and so finally, we've got a roadmap of work that's still to be done. Like we say, it's a journey. Uh, we've made it visible so people, when they look at our accessibility statement, 
know that we're still working on things and point out the areas that they, they may have issues with, um, manage those expectations. I think that earns trust and, and goodwill. I think if we hold our hands up to the imperfections and provide ways for people to, to work around it, it goes a long way. So be clear on the routes for inquiries and complaints. Um, if someone needs to get in touch because they can't access something the way they would choose to, um, then you need a way to handle those inquiries without bouncing them around internally and causing extra frustrations. It shouldn't be a surprise when that inquiry is received by your colleagues. And one of the things that we're going to do is make a link directly on the accessibility notice so that people can get in touch and that will get routed um, in a more automated way. I hope some of that has been useful for you guys. I'm going to hand back to Nathan now and we'd love to hear some of your experiences and questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, that was fantastic. And of course, Jennifer as well. Thank you. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree that there's some just really useful information that's been shared with us there. Um, I'd like to take the next couple of minutes actually to um, to throw some questions at you and we've had a couple of questions come in from our from our audience as well uh, so I'd like to go through some of those um, before we do I will I will share the poll results with everybody um, so last chance to get your your poll votes in going once going twice okay let's get those shared so um, some some really interesting stuff that comes through on the poll actually so question number one have you ever tried to navigate a website using a keyboard only and as sarah said we kind of missed a a bit of a a, a, a crucial thing here uh, on that but uh most people have seen that done before which is great um we've also got uh what's our next question here so we've got have you seen or heard how a screen reader uh, navigates a website uh, most people, uh, it's not quite been built into everybody's testing process yet, but actually more more than I expected on that. 40% of people saying that it's already built into their process, which is really great. Uh, the effort of, uh, what, what, what a great statistic this one, the effort of creating an accessible web delivers proportionate value. 100% agree. Phew, good. That's excellent. Um, how widely is the uh, the vision of accessibility shared and understood in your institution by some? And I, I think this is uh, there's a question from from a member in our audience actually that kind of alludes to to some more around this, um, which I think is uh, which is in interesting. And thankfully, most people say that they are well on their way uh, to accessibility nirvana. Uh, there, which is which is really nice. Um, there's actually a couple of questions for the panelists directly, uh, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to go straight to those actually, if that's all right. Uh, so the the Carl Turner has asked Sarah, could Sarah say a bit more about the work she had to do with senior leadership at the university to get their support and funding for working in an accessible way? Now, I want to also add in a, a second question here, which is from Chris Sherwood, who says, I work as a UX designer slash accessibility specialist for a university across multiple projects and I'm seeking buy-in to get more resources. Jennifer made some excellent points. I am pushing a user-led design and accessibility best practices, but it's just me and clearly need more dedicated, dedicated resources. Any tips on making a case or getting it heard by senior uh, management? So I think the, the question here is around how do we how do we fight for the case of accessible and inclusive design to senior management? Sarah, would you like to take the reins on that to, to begin yeah. with? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll start actually by saying I was I was pretty lucky actually, and I think maybe it's it almost was easier with people at the top because they're less. Um, it, it, it's not them that you're creating some of the work for. Um, so the buy-in for me was pretty good at the top. Um, but I think it's, you, you're likely to meet resistance where it impacts somebody's workload, is my experience anyway. Um, and I think what my experience has been is if you can show people 
um, some some users and some some example cases of, of problems, you'll you'll get buy-in more easily. So when I've played uh, videos of user testing sessions to developers, as an example, um, that that's really powerful in, in getting some uh, buy-in. I think. Um, and like Jennifer says, you don't necessarily have to spend a fortune to do that. There's likely people around uh, your organization that could help you. Um, and those resources that Jennifer mentioned as well are really useful for showing people real life examples. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, have you got anything to add? Yeah, no, Sarah, that, that's fantastic. Um, I completely agree um, that the impact of, you know, people being sat down and saying, take a look at, you know, uh, this user's experience is so powerful. Um, I was just going to add, you said everything um, I wanted to, to, to touch on and just to add to what you, you said as well, which is <clears throat> maybe some of that buy-in could be uh, that a lot of those sort of micro changes are free. Um, so when it comes to, you know, we don't have to buy or invest in too much more software if, you know, there's built in accessibility checkers into some of the, the programs we're already using to create content. Um, so let's start with the free tools first, um, you know, for each, for content writers and, and designers, developers. Um, and then, yeah, those resources where you can sort of create, you know, a set of personas or in, in the agile environment for developers, user statements as a screen reader user, I need it to function this way. And then, you know, if you if you have user stories that are already in play and then add people's experiences of accessibility to existing user stories or user personas, that's free and it takes some time and energy. It takes everyone off the floor to create them. Once it's done, then you have them um, hopefully ideally placed in a, a center of excellence. So one of the, and I think it's it's obviously it can tell in the Q and A it's getting really it's it's popular, but your uh, your color palette is so valuable. It's it's a guide to say these are the colors that pass WCAG or you know that are are sufficient for people. Just post that for everyone. So yeah, it stops the siloing. It stops the I didn't know. I didn't know that. You know, it it, it stops apathy. Um, so Chris, I totally I loved what you wrote. Um, that's amazing that you've got sort of a UX or inclusive design led process that you want to implement. Maybe the best thing to say at the moment is that here are some free resources. Let's have a shut down production for half a day to do a co-design session, ideally with real people, which would be a little bit more time consuming and maybe a bit expensive because people should be paid for their time. But um, if not, let's look at, I've done this with teams before, which is let's take a look at all your you know, digital properties, your designs, and maybe we'll walk through them and say, are, are we causing barriers or still with the way it's the page is laid out or the way it's written or the way the functionality works. And then, yeah, walk through maybe five, we don't want to pigeonhole people, but maybe walk five, five disability types through those, those designs and then, you know, identify those issues. And then we have a list of things to fix. Um, but yeah, having free, easily accessible um, to everyone uh, guides and things in a, and a consolidated center um, points everyone in the right direction, I find. Yeah, I was going to say as well, actually, that you don't have to spend a lot of money to, to make some important changes. Um, and I was also going to add, uh, when we talk about color contrast, be really careful if you're using design and digital agencies, they'll they'll talk about being really great at a lot of things. And the number of times that I've worked with um, experts and and they forget to check color contrast this it happens all the time so you can you can check it yourself for free and, and and do do that I would never recommend just assuming that because you're working with an agency that say they're good at something that, they, that they'll do that True. and there's uh there's a, there's kind of a really Absolutely. great question that's come in from Michael Gleason almost around that so you know as, as a as a certified nerd, um, I uh, I like to run all my tests on on the the command line and and things like that. Um, but I know that there's a number of other tools that people find really useful. Uh, things like the Axe Chrome extension is always really useful. But Michael Gleason asks, can you all mention a few of your favourite authoring and testing tools? 
when it comes to contrast checker there's a really good website that i use it's not, it looks really nice and clean so i'll share that uh, with you nathan um, and you can put the url on the webinar page my favorite yeah. is so we are uh, yeah we're closely related to um dq that works that that has ax so ax and uh, dq inside improve continuously work on we have the same accessibility checks so i my favorite is the site improve chrome extension checker uh, which is free as well um, but to that point um, you can either test single pages with you know the same rule set whether you're using site improve or ax uh, both are equally valid and um, equally reliable um, or yeah the the platform has built in uh, we have a built-in color contrast checker as well but you what, know, if you're what? not in if you're not into a platform overall or platform solution um, there's yeah Sarah there's web aim or there's other contrast checkers out there for sure the, and, the one oh, thing I I really liked with with site improve that actually I think Sarah introduced me to so we we work with WordPress a lot and the new Gloucestershire mm -hmm. um, website is is built on WordPress and uh, Site Improve has a, a Site Improve plugin, and it works really nicely. It adds a little tab, and you can check things. It works well with the extension and stuff, um, you know. And it really, it really complements other tools like Google Lighthouse, which which is great for a kind of quick scan. But um, mm -hmm. the Site Improve tooling is is honestly really good because it gives you that such a, a site level overview and the benchmark against peers and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, right. there's a couple of user testing platforms that I've used as well, which work really well, um, both in recruiting people, but also mm -hmm. um, doing some very small, cheap tests. Um, so again, I'll share the URL with Nathan and he can add that online for you. Yeah, I've got some free, again, so continuing on with the WAI free resources I mentioned before, they have um, easy checks, which is kind of a step-by-step -step guide to checking the most important stuff of WCAG. So yeah, yeah. I'll throw that in too. Cheers. Yeah, and for some really cheap uh, ways to involve real users, just advertising around your university can be really, really cheap way of getting some testers in. And often people really like to help, especially if you give them a free sandwich or biscuit or something. <laughs> awesome. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, I am afraid that that's all we have time for today. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this webinar from Smile in association with Site Improve. I also hope that you'll agree that accessibility benefits everyone, but it is also everyone's responsibility. Um, I hope that you can find new ways to approach and talk to people and learn more about the things that you can do to help. And most of all, I hope that you can use those pointers from Jennifer to start building your roadmap for your accessibility journey. It's a long road ahead, you know, that whole two to four years thing. Uh, and I'm sure that you'll have some awkward conversations along the way. But uh, that reminder that you are centers for good in the community. And, and if you can be truly inclusive, I'm hopeful that others will follow suit. So remember that accessibility is not a checkbox exercise um, and that it, it really and truly can change lives. So thank you again. Uh, do check out the resources on our website. And if you're not already, then subscribe to our mailing list for updates on more webinars from Smile, along with the recording for this webinar and the slides. We have a, a really great student marketing insight webinar coming up, and that's going to be an absolute blast. Uh, so on behalf of the panelists, Smile, Site Improve, and myself, thank you so much for attending and have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.